Works of art and architecture must be protected if they are to be around for future generations. In this program, we will look at what restorers do in three specific fields. The preservation of wood, the restoration of paintings, and the rejuvenation of paper and photographs. The Arctic used to be a very different place than it is today. Recently, a team of Canadian scientists found the remains of a tropical forest in the Arctic that dates back to a period just on the heels of the extinction of dinosaurs. The wood of the surviving stumps had remained intact over all this time. It looks and feels almost like freshly cut wood. It splits and splinters. It can even be carved with a knife. The only thing missing was wood's distinctive scent, the oils having evaporated long ago. Wood may be an extremely perishable material, but sometimes, under certain conditions, as we have seen, it can last for centuries. On one of the short summer days in the Arctic, in 1985, a helicopter pilot was flying over Axel Heiberg Island, some 1,200 kilometers from the North Pole. Suddenly, he spotted some tree stumps, branches, and tree trunks below. He had just discovered the remains of a tropical forest some 45 million years old. The forest, which had grown at a time when Arctic temperatures were much hotter, was largely populated by giant sequoias, huge evergreens resembling the gigantic Californian redwoods. All the organic matter in this forest has been perfectly conserved. It even has an intact forest floor, complete with leaves, cones, and seeds. How could it be? One hypothesis is that the entire forest was buried very suddenly under a sea of sediment as a result of a flood. Since sediment provides a bacteria, fungi, and oxygen-free environment, the forest never decomposed. This unique phenomenon posed a serious problem for conservationists. The buried wood had become impregnated with water. Once exposed to air, the wood quickly dries out, becomes deformed, cracks, and contracts. And the leaves would remain visible for an hour or two at the most before simply disintegrating. So the specialists resorted to special conservation techniques to save what was left of the forest, as these remains could teach us a great many things about the evolution of our planet. To accomplish this, they took their inspiration from, among other things, the techniques used to restore wreckage. When an object saturated with water dries out, the displacement of the water damages the internal structure. It has to be freeze-dried or lyophilized. Lyophilization occurs naturally in winter when in very cold and sunny weather, snow diminishes without melting. The technique consists of first freezing the water, then eliminating it by evaporating the ice without the water ever turning into its liquid state. With small objects, like the little pieces of wood found on Axel Heiberg Island, the freeze-drying process is done in a special device with a vacuum chamber. By creating a vacuum, the ice evaporates without ever becoming liquid. Natural lyophilization was used, for example, to save ships dating back to 1750 that were discovered near Quebec City in 1985. They were completely buried in mud. They were first frozen, then placed outside, under a tent left open at both ends. The long hours of sunshine every day warmed the frozen wood and the ice evaporated. 
Objects which undergo this process can lose about 34% of their weight in water, at which time they have regained their stability and can then be moved indoors. However, it is risky to subject anything that is waterlogged to extremely cold temperatures. When water freezes, it expands, and this damages the wood's cellular structure. To prevent this from happening, part of the water is replaced by another liquid, which is less voluminous once frozen. This stump, which was brought back from Axel Heiberg Island, is undergoing water replacement treatment. For several months now, it has been immersed in a solution containing 30% polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol is a synthetic polymer that is soluble in water. It facilitates the lyophilization process, not only by preventing damage caused by the forming of ice during the freezing, but also by preserving the wood in its expanded state after drying. Cracks and deformations do not occur. This stump is weighed regularly. It will remain immersed until its weight remains stable, which is a sign that it has become totally impregnated with the polyethylene glycol solution. Next, it will be lyophilized under vacuum. Conserving the leaves and cones from the Axel Heiberg Island forest proved a far more delicate operation. The specimens are so fragile that they would be destroyed if subjected to the same process used for the wood. The conservation treatment consists rather of exposing the specimens to a gaseous coating agent. The coating agent is called paraline, a product used to coat delicate electronic circuits. The objects to be treated are placed in a vacuum chamber. The paraline, in powder form, is put into an oven and heated until it reaches a temperature of 650 degrees Celsius. The gas produced is channeled through a tube into the vacuum chamber. There, the paraline gas molecules are polymerized. That is, they link together on contact with the object. They form a transparent film over the entire surface of a porous object and even penetrate it to a certain degree. Since it is transparent, Caroline does not alter the appearance of the cones and leaves, but makes them stronger. So the remains of the Axel Heiberg forest and all the information they contain about the climatic and geological evolution of our planet will not just turn into dust. A story like the Axel Heiberg Island one shows us how important vestiges can be for man to understand his past. Still, natural remains are not the only vestiges needing protection. Buildings, artifacts, books are as worthy as dinosaur bones or plant fossils. They are all prey to many dangers. Natural disasters like floods, fires, or simply the passage of time, which we can do nothing about. But man is the greatest destroyer of all. Through wars, vandalism, and varying degrees of neglect, he has already caused, and will continue to cause, irreparable damage. Restoration and conservation are all the more delicate and important when the object to be preserved is a work of art. Just like human beings, paintings can get sick, sometimes by accident, but also because of age. All paintings get old, whether done by a famous artist or by your great-great-uncle. Their colors fade, their varnish yellows. The paint cracks, lifts. The canvas itself slackens. In short, the work slowly deteriorates and the process will not stop unless the painting is given to a restorer, the doctor of works of art. The restorer's first job is to make a diagnosis. What state is the painting in? What materials were used to paint it? Has it already been restored? To find answers to these questions, the restorer, like the doctor, resorts to various diagnostic tests. First, the painting can be studied under different types of lighting. 
Low angled light, for example, makes defects in the painting surface stand out, such as cracks and raised areas. With this technique, the canvas is lit by a light beam at a 10 degree angle. Ultraviolet lighting enables the restorer to see touch-ups painted over the layer of varnish. As a rule, when a painting is finished, the artist covers it with a coat of varnish. The varnish is usually fluorescent, whereas paint seldom is. The ultraviolet test allows the restorer to determine, among other things, whether the signature on the painting was added over the varnish, which could mean that the painting is a fake. Another technique, infrared reflectography, provides a more in-depth examination. The painting is studied by means of a closed circuit television system. The camera is equipped with a tube that is sensitive to infrared rays. The infrared image on the screen will reflect, for instance, carbon-based elements. It can thus reveal the artist's preliminary sketch, usually done with a carbon-based pencil. X-rays are used to look even deeper into the artwork. This method, exactly the same as the one used by doctors or dentists, is based on a very simple principle of physics. Heavy elements absorb X-rays easily. Colors made of heavy elements like white lead or vermilion leave a precise image on the film. Conversely, the zones painted with colors made of light elements like ochre or organic colors are fairly transparent on x-rays and can barely be seen on the film. X-rays will sometimes reveal a first painting underneath the painting being examined. In fact, old paintings were almost all painted with heavy elements as white lead was used as a base for color blends. Nowadays, colors are made of lighter elements, as the preferred bases are zinc oxide or titanium, both less toxic than lead. When a recent painting is done over an old painting, the X-ray will reveal the old painting more clearly than the recent one. All the information collected when examining a painting will be useful to a restorer. Not only will it reveal the painting's history, but also the consequences of its misfortunes. Once the problems have been clearly identified, restoration of the painting can begin. In some cases, paintings are remounted using glue onto another canvas. This is a very delicate operation and is done on a table on which the painting is held down by suction. One of the next stages consists of removing the varnish covering the painting it is the varnish that gives paintings over time that yellowish tint. In fact, even before the varnish is touched, it is possible to see what the work will look like. All you need to do is use a slide projector with a blue filter in it. The blue cancels out the yellow in the varnish, and the painting's true colors appear clearly. The restorer then focuses attention upon the damaged areas according to a rule that has now become universal. All repairs must be reversible. Any touch-ups must be easily removable. Unfortunately, this rule didn't used to apply and many paintings have been damaged by overly zealous restorers. The touch-ups can be invisible to the naked eye or only discernible from close up owing to a touch-up technique known as tratigio. This technique enables the restorer to reconstitute missing parts with tiny strokes. For example, to fill in a missing area of a painting so as to be able to undo it if need be. A restorer will use a material that is different and often lighter than those used in the original. As for the touch-ups, they are done with colors that are soluble in solvents other than those used in the original. So, to repair an oil painting, you would use water-soluble paints like aquarelles or acrylics. Finally, once the painting has been restored, it is revarnished. The painting is, at last, cured. 
Within a few centuries, even the most ordinary aspects of our own everyday existence will arouse curiosity. Large sums of money may well be spent acquiring and preserving such relics as a photograph of your first communion, your first love letter, or your will. And oddly enough, one of the most important means of recording history has been paper, despite the fact that it is one of the world's most perishable materials. In ideal conditions of temperature, light, and humidity, ancient documents have been preserved intact for centuries. However, sometimes simply removing them from the spot they were kept has caused them to disintegrate in only a few years' time. Today, museum curators are working jointly with restorers in efforts to prevent this kind of destruction. Our archives and libraries have been growing steadily over the centuries. Deeds, musical scores, letters, books, drawings, and more recently, photographs are collected, sole testimony to our forebearers' ideas, feelings and lives. But all these relics are fragile and often need restoring. Paper is an organic product, mainly composed of cellulose, a natural polymer found in wood and in other plants, including seaweed. It is therefore degradable. One of the main reasons paper deteriorates is acidity, which causes the cellulose molecules to fragment. The paper then becomes fragile and brittle. The acidity can come from pollutants in the atmosphere, waste from chemicals used in the pulp whitening process, and also from the degradation of impurities in the paper itself. Paper does not only consist of cellulose, but also of undesirable compounds like lignin and hemicellulose. These compounds degrade much faster than cellulose releasing colored acidic products. Paper manufactured before the 19th century is stronger than today's paper. The raw materials used back then consisted of rags of linen, cotton, or hemp rather than wood. In fact, wood produces a poorer quality paper because its cellulose is less pure than in other plant fibers. One of the stages in the restoration process of paper consists of removing all degradation products that not only produce acidity, but also color the paper. Fortunately, these products are largely water-soluble. The paper is immersed in a container of water or simply placed on the water surface. In some cases, where the ink is soluble, for instance, the water must be vaporized, then sucked through a mesh on the other side of the sheet. The washing process also makes the paper more pliable, since the paper regains some lost humidity. If the paper continues to be too acidic, it has to be further treated with alkaline products, which serve to neutralize the acids. Once the paper has been stabilized chemically, it then has to be stabilized mechanically. Some holes can be filled by hand, but there are cases, especially when it comes to books, where it is best to use a special machine. Before using this machine, the surface of the missing area has to be measured with a planimeter. How much paper is missing is deduced from the thickness of the sheet of paper. The paper is then placed on a mesh in a tank filled with water. The exact quantity of pulp needed to fill the holes is then poured into the water. The pulp used must have been previously manufactured and colored to closely resemble the paper being restored. The water is then aspirated and the pulp settles into the holes. All that remains to be done is to put the paper under the press. But archives contain much more than just papers. They also house souvenirs that are even more fragile, photos. Here the problem is the degradation of the photoemulsion, that is the chemicals that produce the image. Degradation of this kind is almost always irreversible. This means that besides cleaning and stabilizing operations, nothing can be done to recapture the original image. But there are exceptions. 
For example, some black and white photographs that have become yellow or tarnished due to age can be treated. Indeed, what causes such discoloration is the transformation of the metallic silver, which constitutes the original image, into silver sulfide, a compound that is a yellowish-brown color. The process consists of transforming the silver sulfide back into metallic silver. This is done by soaking the photo in a solution containing a powerful oxidizing agent to whiten it. The solution causes the silver sulfide and the metallic silver to oxidize into a white compound called silver bromide. The oxidation is in fact a return to the original state because the silver was in the form of silver bromide before the photo was developed. After the washing process, all that remains to be done is to redevelop the original photo. Finally, the restorer's last task is to make sure that the treated works are preserved in the proper condition. 3,000 years before our time, the Egyptians used to write on papyrus, paper made from reeds. But the most ancient papers known to man are from China. They date back to the second century AD. Paper memory has been tried and tested. Nowadays, we store information on tapes and diskettes. But we might ask ourselves whether computer memory will prove as indestructible as we think it will.